Hello everyone, this is Lauren Berthelsen, Editor-in-Chief for Leatherati.com, and uh, I'm pleased to be here today with uh, K.J. Nichols, uh, who, as he just told me, is a wuzzy, uh, Mr. Connecticut Leather 2013. K.J., how are you this morning? Not too bad, and I prefer fuzzy wuzzy. I earned this fur. <laughs> <laughs> fuzzy wuzzy, I like that. That's much better. <laughs> so tell me, uh, you're, uh, what are you doing now that you're retired? Um, from the, well, from the title I... scene, that is. <laughs> right. Retired, as we all know, we we don't actually retire. We just hand off the uh, the new and shiny to somebody else. But um, so this past year, or the after um, becoming a wuzzy, my main focus has been uh, supporting the current Connecticut leather. Um, I've also done some stuff here or there, uh, out promoting. I just got invited to go out to Iowa as Tally Master, and it's just a matter. Of, I want to be visible and continue to be visible in the community as much as I can. But I'm also resulting from the title of the year of trying to get my finances back in order. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a common complaint with a lot of title holders, especially people who travel a lot, go to IML and do all that. It's a, it's an expensive endeavor. It is, and I don't regret it in any way, shape, or form. It was uh, an amazing, an amazing year of traveling and meeting people and meeting the community um, that I knew it going in. Uh, I hope people actually, once they actually take this under under account, you know, know what they're getting into when they go into the titles, but I also hope that the community understands that what these people are doing out in the community isn't, isn't free, <laughs> it, you know, yeah. not, it shouldn't be something to be complained about, but it's, it's definitely something to be acknowledged, I think. And, and people are incredibly generous in the community, uh, in Absolutely. terms of helping out and places to stay and transportation and things like that, so it, it helps out a lot. Absolutely, I just had, uh, I actually just ended up going to MAL this past year um, in January uh, by the good graces of some, some amazing people because uh, unfortunately I had some life issues where I had to buy a new car <laughs> on top of everything else and rejuggle my finances and didn't think I was going to be able to go and the community stepped up and some you know amazing gentlemen stepped up and I got to be honest I'm not always good at getting gifts and uh, accepting it so I, I told the mom like if this is, if this isn't gracious please it's only because I'm awkward not because I'm not appreciative <laughs> Now I want to back up a minute into into 2012 uh before you were you uh you ascended to the title of uh, Mr. Connecticut Leather 2013 what prompted you to get on that stage Uh good question and um I, I had been involved in the community and uh, through the Bear community, through the Northeast Ursaman, which is a great group. And in the Ursaman, there are a couple of leather bears, and, and one in particular was Matt Kenny, the current Mr. Connecticut Leather, who I had been friends and you know I supported during his year, um, and actually was there when he won his title and uh, stood right next to his partner while his partner cried, and <laughs> you know I try, you know. It, emotions are catching, you're right, you know, the big leather man on the side goes, damn, but, um, so I watched Matt have an amazing year, and towards the end of it, uh, um, the Northeast Ocean host Miss Connecticut Bear, and so I went to that, and afterwards we went back to Matt and his partner, um, David's house, and we're all sitting there having a great, um, dinner, just talking about leather and bears and, and everything, and towards the end, as I'm getting my jacket on, Matt uh, comes up to me and goes, I think you should go for Mr. Connecticut Leather. <laughs> and my response immediately was, you're full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that question stuck. Or that, that he, as he says, he planted a seed. <laughs> um, it stuck with me. And I went through three weeks of really deep soul searching going, is this something I really want to go for? Um, is this something I actually have ironically, have the balls to go for. Um, I had a couple of things that I was really afraid of. Um, I was afraid of being a trans guy up on stage um, and getting some backlash from it, because I read all the... During that three weeks, I read all the crap that was said about Tyler with Tyler won, you know, IML. Wow. And saw how he handled it, and he's a great mentor and a great um, person. But... There were two things that ca that were the catalyst as to why I actually ran. Um, first one was actually reading this particular thing on Leatherati, where this guy uh, posted after Tyler won that he was going to burn all his leathers, that the community was dead. 
I was so pissed off because I'm like, if you think that one person happening to be the face of the community for IML for one year is going to change your community that you want to burn all your leathers, you're not part of the community. Mm. <laughs> was So I was like, okay, this guy can't, you know, Tyler can't be standing up there alone. And the second point was honestly me ex- understanding that I, I personally at the time never saw a big guy as a title holder. My second thought right after, because I usually try to think of things from a lot of angles, was I've actually never seen a big guy run. So, money where your mouth is, let's see what this is really about. You know, the, you hear often that the um, the competitions are pretty much just a pageant. Um, and from what I heard, you know, learned from my community and actually winning, it's not about a pageant because I don't have the Tom of Finland body size, um, but I've got a lot of heart and my heart is what I get told over and over again, which is what won my competition is the fact that I've got deep roots in my community and, um, I want to be out there and change what I need, needed and thought I needed, you know, could do it and help to change. So, you know, I didn't, uh. I didn't see you compete for Mr. Connecticut Leather, but I did see you on stage at IML, and you owned that stage. Uh, it's how did you do that? Where did where did you pull that from inside you to do that? I had, um, I mean, because me being transgender, I've got uh, friends on both sides of the spectrum, and I have a longtime friend uh, who she's owns a piercing shop in Provincetown. So you guys, some of you guys might have gotten poked by her. Um, Bearded lady, she's a large uh, Scorpio bull dagger butch who years and years ago pulled me aside when I was standing at a party because I was standing there, you know, huddled up and she comes over, she goes, stop doing that. I'm like, stop doing what? She goes, stop standing there like you're apologizing for your size. Look around and no one else is doing that. That was one of those conversations that totally changed me because... I did. I had that moment of looking around and like nobody else, no matter what their size or you know gender, because obviously we're a crazy little bunch. Um, nobody was apologizing for it. So over the years, it's been a matter of accepting myself for my size, and it's the reason why I have joy tattooed in my belly. <laughs> I wanted to start celebrating the things that I hated. After years of hating my body, did the same thing with my chest and getting my chest tattooed. Um, but as for IML, I'm like, I got to the point that I'm like, this is me. <laughs> if you really don't like it, you, you best start kissing my ass and, you know, start early because it's big. It's going to take a while. Um, so <laughs> on the other aspect of I knew that other people were going to see me and other big, you know, um, people that may not be fit the stereotype of being a smaller guy would be inspired. I had this great moment where one of my IML brothers who didn't make top 20 ran up to me after the competition and told me this great story of uh, how he'd been trying to get one of his friends to go for their personal um, local competition and how this gentleman had all the gear, had been involved in the community, um, all around good heart, good guy, leather heart, and kept on saying no year after year and apparently my brother got this text in the middle of the uh, competition this year where he's watching it on Leatherati and he texts my brother saying I just saw the video and if KJ can do it so can I I'm running wow right there were so many moments like that of not just the whole inspiring for being a trans guy but inspiring for just owning my body up on stage that were incredibly personal and incredibly beautiful that I got to share with people this past year or during my title year rather. Now clearly uh, you don't have to come out on stage as, as, as a big furry bear because people can see that with their eyes. Why did you make the choice to come, to, uh, to uh, let, let the audience know that you're trans? Because to be honest I get to the point that I'm so far in my transition that a lot of people don't even see it. I literally had one of my brothers in the top 20 run up to me after I came off on stage, grabbed my shoulders, and went, I didn't know. Now, it had been in my bio the whole entire time. It had been in all the conversations that I talked about because I think being out and being open about it is going to inspire communication, which is what I wanted to do during my title year. Um, To come out on stage was to let everyone else know that, like, yes, there are trans men that are in our community and that are a vital part of our community. Um, 
and to educate them. It's going to start conversations. I'm not going to be everyone's best friend. I'm not going to be everyone's sex symbol. Um, but I am going to be someone that's going to inspire communication and uh, conversation, whether or not you like me or not. It's still going to be something you talk about. How do you, how do you explain? There seems to be a visceral fear that cis guys have of trans men. Uh, how do you explain that? Knowledge or lack thereof. Mm. I really think you know you fear what you don't know. <laughs> and let's be honest, I'm like. I started transitioning at 28. I am a couple of weeks away from 42. And when I was young, I didn't know. Like, And then something that I feared, my first thought was at age 11, and I stuffed it down for another 17 years because that fear is so palatable. Um, it's going to be the same thing with, with uh, cis men, you know, cis gay men about interacting with uh, trans men. It's just because there's a deep-seated fear then. What goes back to getting, you know, I think a lot of the fear is also rooted in how the, you know, how they broach the subject. That is one thing for me. I've always told everyone, like, you can talk to me. You can use whatever vocabulary you want. All I ask is that you use positive connotations to what you're asking. Um, if you're asking with negative ones just to be an ass, then I'll probably call you on it. <laughs> I do often. I try to do it as gently as possible because I want people to understand what their vocabulary means. Um, and even then, I'm like, some people, we just, I just got in the conversation with someone the other day, uh, there was, I forget her, forgive me, I forget her name, the actress that plays Queenie on The Coven, right. who just had, just blew the word training all over on an interview, and is getting lambasted by Lambda, and <laughs> he was upset that she was getting, uh, you know, backlash for using that word, and he's like, what do you think of that word? And I was like, well... Honestly, I use it, in, and sometimes I piss other trans men and trans women off because I do use it. Um, but I use it with positive connotations, and I use it in company that I know are, are going to hear it in positive connotations. And sometimes it's difficult because even if I'm using positive connotations, someone that might not have an open mind, they're going to hear it with the negative ones, and that's where we've got to be careful. Um, I'm not a PC police, <laughs> obviously, if I'm, you know, throwing that word around as well, but we just have to be aware, and like, and if you do offend someone, I guarantee we're all going to offend someone <laughs> at one point in time. It's whether or not, you know, you can go back to that person and explain, this is where I was coming from, uh, and being accountable for your actions and your words, yeah. and I hope that people call me on mine. Well, queer used to be that same word. People yeah. were, were, were deadly, they had horrible reactions to that word queer, and now it's kind of a celebrated, you know, people embrace being gender queer or, or you know, or sexuality queer or anything like that, so it's, it's definitely morphed. Right, and, and, and that's what I mean of being able to explain, the, you know, what you mean behind the word, you know, if you happen to offend someone. And like I said, we're, we're all going to offend someone at some point, and like, you can't please everyone. But being able to own what you're saying and own the, you know, the connotation behind it, that's going to help morph, you know, the word trans or tranny or whatever, I think, in my mind, in my opinion only, <laughs> um, into something that's more celebrated and why, you know, I feel comfortable mm -hmm. using it around a bunch of gay men. But even then, I've had, you know, a couple of gay guys go, <gasps> and I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> That word's a bad word and where I'm from. I'm like, oh. Well, I'm like, well, I'm taking it back and I'm owning it. <laughs> <laughs> You've mentioned a couple of times about this classic, stereotypical Tom of Finland profile. Uh, do you think that our contests are moving beyond that? I certainly hope so. Um, I think for some people that's still very much alive. Uh, the, the way I see competitions is, you know, especially it's the perfect microcosm of you're interviewing to be a community figurehead for the next year so it, it's a job interview it really is and some people want the good looking product other people's want you know want the product that has heart and that you know that is more substantial hopefully you know you get a more from the two and understand that beauty really isn't always just one small uh now view you know there was an amazing amount of men in my group that were all different sizes, and it wasn't the look that, in my opinion, it wasn't the look that actually tied us all together. It was, I really could see commonalities, I love being able to talk, commonalities between how we actually approach the world. 
in, in, in our actions and what we do. And that was more um, binding than versus, you know, what everyone actually saw on mm. stage. What do you so. think about the, what are your thoughts on the International Trans con Contest takes place in Atlanta? I honestly, I don't know a lot about it. <laughs> um, I know it's been up a, for a couple of years now. Um, I know that it was uh, built based on the fact that um, trans men wanted to actually, uh, or trans people wanted a, a place to compete to actually um, be visible. I think it's it's valid for some people, but for others, like like I, I don't want to pigeonhole myself personally into this is the only aspect of my personality or uh, of me. Um, so for some people, I think it's a viable um, interest. For others, I wanted I wanted something bro broader. You know, there's a there's a lot of criticism nowadays about how we're mainstreaming ourselves, the leather community, gay people. You know, we've mainstreamed ourselves to the fact where we're acceptable everywhere almost now. <clears throat> is, is the same thing happening with trans men? I mean, is there a, is there a push to, uh, or just trans people in general, to to mainstream yourself so you no longer have to attach that title to yourself? And is that good or bad? Um, personally, I'm like I don't ever want to disappear and and not acknowledge the fact that I'm trans. Uh, for the fact that, I mean, it's not just leather that I'm fighting. Uh, <laughs> trans peoples are still, the, their rights are not of the same caliber as everyone else. I'm like, I, gay rights were about 50 years behind, um, you know, African-American. Women's rights were 50 years ahead of, of that. Trans people, I'm like, I live in Massachusetts, even though I'm Mr. Connecticut Leather, for a very specific reason, and that's because I am protected by law to not lose my job, to not lose my housing, specifically just because somebody could find out that I'm trans. Um, when everyone has that, those rights, I may not be so visible about, you know, acknowledging the fact that that's a, a definite big part of me. Um, so mainstreaming, I'm like, I, I don't want, I don't ever want it to go away because I think we've got a lot to fight for. If and when we come to the facts that we don't have to fight for, I'm still going to be out because, especially when I'm hanging out in the leather community and the in the gay community, um, I'm attracted to men. <laughs> and let's be honest: for some gay men, a handshake is reaching you know in between the thighs. <laughs> True. That's an awkward conversation <laughs> if I don't actually have that, or if people don't know. Um, so. I, I still have to be out and open, in my opinion. I'm like for some others, I'm like they they do go stealth, and I think going stealth is a matter of sometimes being protecting yourself mm -hmm. um, from other things of going back to you, losing your job, losing your housing, losing your kids if you have kids. Yeah, I was a young gay man. One of my best friends was a, a trans woman, and she uh, never identified as that. She only wanted to identify as uh, as a cis female because she wanted to put all that behind her and never have to deal with that again. It was, it was, it was a strong point for her. So yeah. It is, and then, honestly, I'm like, I have a male privilege now, <laughs> and I acknowledge that. Um, when the statistics are one out of every 12 murders is a trans you know, person, and most of those are trans women, and if you're a trans woman of color, that's one out of every eight. Wow. That's some scary stuff. <laughs> so I own my privilege in the fact that I can be out and honestly be safer. <laughs> or what I think is safer. I could be totally wrong and get my ass beat someday too. But, it, you know, hopefully I'll have some friends and allies, both gay and straight, and uh, who are going to protect myself if I rate myself in that position. Well, as you said earlier, if they're going to beat your ass, they better get started. It's going to take a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said kiss, but beat? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> So I want I want to talk about I want to talk about <laughs> I want to talk about family for a minute. On your uh, Mr. Connecticut Leather uh, Facebook page, you say um, uh, my chest gets tight when I think about how you what much you welcomed me into your leather families. Anyone who truly knows me knows how much having a family means to me. What is your What does your family look like? My family puts the fun in dysfunction. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I'm out to my family. Uh. I don't really talk to on my mother's side from so, some stuff that happened when we were younger that I don't agree with. At age 19, I literally had to tell um, my mother, and that's the person that I kind of grew up with, that I needed positive people in my life, and she wasn't one of them. Um, so that side of my family is very strange. 
Um, and then there's my father, and the poor bastard is this beautiful wasp of a man with a good heart, but I've come out to him eight ways to Sunday, <laughs> and I don't think, he, I think he's waiting for me one day to just, you know, flip back and be like, okay, now I'm a straight woman. I'm like, no, I'm really never going there, but, um, and bless his heart, he tries, but he, he loves me, I don't think he's ever going to understand, but he still loves me, um, and he tries, but it may not always be at the level that I need him, so... Honestly, since like age 19, for the most part, it's it's been me. Uh, I've got one close family relative, which happens to be my gay sister, who is awesome, who was there at Connecticut Leather when I won and crying in the front row. Um, but other than that, I'm like, out of 13 brothers and sisters, I really have no close relations. Um, and nor do I feel like if I ever got myself into a situation that I needed help, that I could call on them. So... My leather family has, and my, you know, the gay community, the people that I've chosen, my chosen family are the ones that over the years have picked my butt up if I needed it or straightened me out if I needed it. Um, there was for years a deep seated, like it was, it was crippling fear of actually going out into the gay community and being acknowledged and accepted um, instead of, you know, in my mind, I hear it totally pictured the being run out of town <laughs> and like it was it was crippling um until i actually had a friend ironically from the northeast searchman who's like the Urshman and the connecticut cruisers connecticut cruisers uh footnote is a uh, uh, a gay men's uh leather group and uh we're having a joint night and it was a leather night and my friend was like you gotta come down i'm like no i don't think so because <laughs> once again the fear is crippling and he's like, come down. I was like, okay, look, talk to the president and find out what, you know, give me an idea of what the hell I'm jumping into. And so he talked to the president, and the president acknowledged that he doesn't know what I'm going to be coming into. And so I went back to, no, no, I'm not going to go out until finally uh, Hendrick <laughs> just kept on bugging me, bugging me. And I went, screw it, threw on my chaps, threw on my vest, went down. Um, Hendrick, you know, brought me in. I suddenly realized that I passed so well that I was like fresh meat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that brought on a whole new subject of how do I out myself to someone? Cause I, you know, it goes back to like our community can be sometimes, well, you know, and beautifully, but sometimes really sexual that I personally need someone to know right off the bat because I want to make, I want to make sure that they make an informed decision. Right. I don't want to be in a, put myself or them in a situation later on that could be volatile or um, hurtful in any way. So for years, the, the next step for me was actually juggling, how do I come out? How do I come out? <laughs> <laughs> and not like come out like militant, you know, hi, how are you doing? I'm trans. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's just like, holy shit, I didn't even get your name yet. <laughs> Something a bit more natural and smooth might be a better approach, I agree. Well, it was great coming out of IML. I pretty much took that off the stage for a while. <laughs> if you didn't know, check the video. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, interesting note that I made to myself when I was watching on stage. In the um, early 90s, uh, probably late 80s, early 90s, uh, it was de rigueur for anyone who was HIV positive to out themselves in their speech or, or whatever. And you really had to, there was really something you had to do. And I, and there was a lot of reasons for it, but that's just what, what people did. Now that's really kind of fallen by the wayside. But I don't think you hear anybody any longer in their speeches or whatever, you know, saying uh, revealing their HIV status. Uh, you think it'll eventually be the same with trans status? I certainly hope so. Um, I I go back to I'm seriously not the only trans guy that's in this community that's active. There are a lot of beautiful trans men that are out there that are doing some great work in the community. Not every one of them is comfortable <laughs> flagging trans. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. <laughs> that, you know, for the same reason that not everyone is as vocal anymore about being HIV positive. It goes back to, it's, you know, for some people, it's simply a small part of them. Someone who's thinking about running for a title, what advice would you give them? Do your research and find out what's really going to be... Uh, you know, what's going to be uh, your requirements for the year. Um, but I had, after winning and everything, I had three points that I always had to give, you know, remind myself. And were very crucial at IML, which was simply, have fun, don't trip, <laughs> have fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and it goes back, you know, I go back to, you're going to take somebody off during your year. Uh, even our current Connecticut leather was going through that. I'm like, relax, let it roll off your back. I'm like, you apologize, you, you move on, you learn from it. Um, but remind yourself that if you do win, you're going to be the face of that community. So take those responsibilities seriously. <laughs> um, it's important. It's really important. You're part of a, a, you will be a part of a great tradition. Do you feel like you dodged the bullet by not being on that podium <laughs> at IML? A little. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I talked to Andy, I saw him uh, a couple weeks ago, and I told him the story of, um, uh, well, I'll, somewhat of a background, like I found out I was doing really, or I found out afterwards, I had done so well that on Sunday, Saturday night, um, it was possible <laughs> that I was going to end up in that podium. Uh you know, and I sat there, and I understood that when I went for it, I'm like, if I won, I'm like, what was I going to do? I'm like, well, I probably acknowledge that I might have to take a hi hiatus from work. <laughs> I might have to uh, totally blow up my 401k to make sure I could do the traveling <laughs> and everyone and everything. Um, and if I won, I was going to take on those responsibilities. I wouldn't have gone through the competition had I not been able to actually um, take those on. But I'll be honest, and they, you know... They announced Robert, and the, then they announced Tib, and when they announced Andy, you might see me on any video. I was short, but any video going <laughs> because I Andy's great, and I acknowledge that he is he's definitely the man for the job. Any one of those could have been the man for the job, but you know, I was happy with where I wanted my goal. Goal really for IML was I wanted to get on top twenty because I really wanted to let people know. Um. Not just, and honestly, my speech wasn't just about educating um, cisgendered gay men or, you know, about it or the community about trans men, but also reminding other trans men that <laughs> things are changing and it, it is a big and beautiful community and you don't always have to be afraid. Mm -hmm. um, so my goal was doing my speech, so I hit my goal. <laughs> Well, the, the crowd uh, reacted thunderously every time you were on stage. I mean, you got enormous applause. It was psychotic to me. Um, I have, if you look at pictures, and I, I've said this to other people, like you look at pictures, everyone's like, you're smiling. I'm like, honestly, I'm laughing. <laughs> I'm <laughs> laughing because every time I walked out on stage and that crowd went nuts, like in my brain, I was like, holy cow. <laughs> what the heck? Um, I just had fun with it. <laughs> Um, and I guess they responded and you know, I had a lot of people come up to me ticked off about where I was. I'm like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not at all, at all, like going out on stage, getting that, that thunderous applause. Once again, it wasn't just for me. It was for every other person that may not see themselves in the typical <laughs> version to be a title holder. Go do it. <laughs> Go flip and do it. <laughs> if more people do it, they'll be more like, there'll be more that don't look, the, you know, that don't look traditional. So. Right, and, and I have nothing against, you know, the beautiful men that are, that do look like that, that model. Hell, I'll muscle worship, like, the best of them. <laughs> <laughs> ask a couple of my brothers. <laughs> One of the things I like to ask people, if, if you had a magic title holder, well, in this case, the title holder was he wand, uh, if you could wave it over our community, what is uh, something you would change about our community? Um... I don't know about change, as in, like, poof, it's totally changed. I would love our community to, um, I guess, I, I let me go back to, I love the New Jersey community when I go down and go visit them. I love their community because they are a community every time you go to an event. There's leather women, there's trans men, there's trans women, there's leather men. Their community is so diverse and, um active <laughs> that I enjoy going down there because there's so many different avenues, uh, so many different perspectives in their community. I would love to see that like in Connecticut, it's, there's not that much for, um, I, I have never really seen that much of a, a woman's community being active and out, but honestly, we're, Connecticut's also really small. <laughs> True. Um, yeah, it's a tiny state. It's kind of like, you know, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts together, we haven't even hit like most other states. So, um, 
so there is a difference in size, but I would love to see the community just remind themselves that we've got to work together. Like The women's community was there for gay men when we first started going through the AIDS epidemic, when they were the caretakers when no one else could because they saw their brothers passing away, which I can't imagine going through. <laughs> but our communities need to not be so worrying. Mm. <laughs> I always say that, like, you know, minorities, I'm like, we're all so busy beating ourselves up that we can't take on the bigger picture. Um, so, the acknowledgement of the bigger picture versus all the little small stuff, <laughs> that's what I would love to see change. That's good advice. KJ, is there anything we didn't talk about today that you feel a burning need to, to get out on the air? Um... No, I think I'm pretty good. <laughs> I'd love to talk about my flaming baton thing, but they didn't let me do it. I know, but you know the whole Susan Sugar Baker thing. That you know, I understand the lights. <laughs> do you really have a flaming baton trick? No. Oh, that'd be awesome if you did. <laughs> As I once said to someone that wanted to do fire play, it was like I've paid for my fur. I don't want to lose it. <laughs> That's a really good point. Yeah. <laughs> Well, KJ, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure speaking to you today, and I really appreciate you uh, uh, taking us down a road that has, I hopefully has enlightened a lot of people about, uh, about about some issues. I hope so, and I'll put this out to everyone. I'm like, if anyone, because I've got this from a lot of trans men, but honestly, if anyone wants to talk about it, I'm like, get a hold of my Facebook page, you know, Mr. Connecticut Leather 2013. Um, I'm open to conversation, and even if it's someone with an opposing view, I'm still open to conversation, just because, once again, I'm like, sometimes I'm never going to change somebody else's mind. I, I never will. Whether or not they change their own minds, that's the important thing, but... Sometimes people need to be educated. I, I want to be that person that, if they need to, they can. So reach out to me, Connecticut Leather, Mr. Connecticut Leather 2013, on Facebook. They've got a great page, and uh, I'll get back to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, KJ. Thank you. That was really